My sweet little whorish Nora, you had an ass full of farts that night, darling, and I fucked them out of you. <laughs> Big, fat fellows, long, windy ones, quick little merry cracks, and a lot of tiny little naughty farties ending in one long gush from your hole. <laughs> that literary delight was written by none other than James Joyce, the modernist mastermind behind Ulysses, who is considered one of the greatest writers of all time. These letters, however, rarely make our reading lists. The dirty letters were penned to his wife, Nora, in 1909, and I'm quite sure that they were intended for her eyes only. However, we find something deeply fascinating in hearing these stories from great figures of history, like the canonical composer, Mozart, who wrote a canon called Lick Mich im Marsch, or in German, Lick Me in the Ass. Or the venerated philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who wrote an autobiography in which he details his lifelong desire to be spanked and dominated by a woman who role-plays as his mama. <laughs> that these figures enjoyed sex, let alone kinky sex, is shocking to us. But kink isn't new, despite the fact it rarely makes our history books. What if we were to change that? What more could we still learn from history if we started to talk about the kinky, sexy parts? How much more interesting would history class be for starters? <laughs> but seriously, I think we could learn a lot more about what it means to be human if we started to talk about these parts of who we are, who we've always been, and stop clouding them in shame. As someone who spends the majority of her life studying sex history, I can assure you that kinks and fetishes are far from a new thing. In the Villa of Mysteries from ancient Pompeii, we can see a winged woman whipping a naked lady who is engaged in erotic dance. In the fittingly named Tomb of the Whipping from the Etruscan civilization, we can see two men spanking and flogging a woman as they mutually pleasure one another. The oldest dildo is 28,000 years old. <laughs> the German researchers who discovered it determined that this phallic shape was likely a sex toy because it was highly polished at the top from overuse. <laughs> <laughs> Even foot fetishes date back to the ancient world. In three of the love letters from the Greek philosopher Philostratus, we can very clearly see his idolization of feet, desiring his lovers to walk barefoot so he can kiss their footprints, and even fantasizing about being trodden on by a pair of beautiful feet. Now, this fetish is far from limited to the ancient world. In one study put out by Dr. Justin Lay Miller, he found that one in seven people today have had a fantasy in which feet or toes play a prominent role. So if I can invite you now just to turn to your left and count down to the sixth person. <laughs> Give them a little wave. And if they're not waving back, it's probably you, so. <laughs> Sigmund Freud, of course, had an insightful take on foot fetishes. He believed that lusting after them was so common because feet and toes closely resemble the shape of a penis. And I honestly believe it would be harder to find a part of the body that Freud does not think looks like a penis. As we came to this 19th century, though, we moved to a highly medicalized worldview. And it was the likes of Freud and Kraft Ebbing who began to define things for the first time, such as fetishism, sadism, masochism, and these other forms of sexual deviation. I think this is where a lot of our modern problems stem from. See, this wasn't just done in an effort to understand these desires and behaviors. It was done to diagnose perversion, 
to define what is normal by scraping away all those edges of freakishness and setting aside those offcuts in shame. Those offcuts, however, account for 50% of our population. Recent studies into the prevalence of kinks and fetishes repeatedly bring up this figure, with multiple studies saying that half of our population has had desires that would be classified as kinky. And there is still so much we don't know about where these desires come from. But we can't do that if these topics keep remaining clouded in stigma and shame. Like how one researcher proposed there could be a biological underpinning for foot fetishism, because the area of the brain responsible for feeling in the feet is very close to the one responsible for genitalia. Or how others have looked to social factors, like one study which found that erotic literature about feet rises exponentially during our four major sexually transmitted epidemics of history. The troubadours were singing praise of the beautiful feminine foot during the gonorrhea epidemic. A fashion of toe cleavage. Toe cleavage emerges during our 16th century syphilis epidemic. And in our more recent AIDS epidemic, erotic magazines were basically marketing foot sex as a safer form of hanky-panky. Now, in themselves, these facts are fascinating. But when put together, they tell a bigger story, a more interesting one. What if, instead of mocking and alienating our kinky desires, we recognize that there were nature-nurture factors which affect our preferences? If someone says that they prefer eating in a quiet pub to an overcrowded bar, to sleeping with five pillows rather than one, we would barely bat an eyelid. But if someone tells us they need to be spat on and spanked to get in the mood, it's likely to end up on a Reddit forum. <laughs> I truly believe that new advances in the way that we communicate has opened up the possibility to change this conversation. We are in a truly unique position, with an immediacy to information as we have never seen it before. Now, if we could utilize those advances to their full potential, we could change the conversation when it came to kinks and fetishes. See, the thing is, I want to talk about TikTok. <laughs> so when we are talking about normalizing the conversation, we have to remember that by this far, TikTok has become one of the most new forms of communication, and kinktok has become one of the most popular hashtags on TikTok, receiving over 10 billion views from around the globe. For so many people, this is the first time they've heard others speaking about or educating on an alternative form of sexuality. TikTok has become this place of self-discovery for so many people. In fact, it's become a commonly laundered phrase that TikTok's algorithm can work out your sexuality before you may realize it yourself. <laughs> now, obviously, there are important drawbacks when it comes to immediacy to information and to sex on TikTok. However, I think we are also being provided a great opportunity to change the conversation when it comes to sexuality, to get rid of fear and shame, and that starts by reconsidering the way that we tell history. See, there was another important commonality in those studies which found half of our population to be a little bit kinky. And that was the huge amount of people who said good education and community were the difference between feelings of anxiety, loneliness and shame and instead replace them with feelings of empowerment, acceptance, and understanding. Learn on TikTok has now received 340 billion views. I think that number speaks for itself. There are a huge amount of people, young people in particular, who are coming onto these platforms as a place for education and community. But if we are going to change the conversation that they receive, it comes from talking about gender, sex, and identity in a way that is uninhibited, organic, vulnerable, 
and real. I try and educate on the history of sex from a place of passion and authenticity that is not held back by these cultural stigmas of shame and repulsion. If we can tell a story of history where we write sex back into the pages, we can see how kinks and fetishes have always played their parts, even in the lives of our most esteemed historical figures. By refusing to let sex remain clouded in secrecy, we take the power back. We let those who are felt underrepresented see themselves in our stories. And kinky desire no longer becomes this abstract construct which we fear to touch, but something that is tangible and bodily and felt, the way that sex was always meant to be. To turn back, finally, to Mr. Joyce and his sweet, dirty little fuckbird, <laughs> I think it is something to celebrate that the author of a book that we consider the modernist Bible is the same person who found blissful joy in hearing the dirty, fat, girlish farts go pop, pop, pop from his wife's bum. And more than that, I think they point to an interesting historical example of one couple playing ethically with the boundaries of kinks and fetishes. Though Nora's replies to these letters have never been found, we can clearly see evidence of a desire that was being mutually explored and respected by two loving and consenting parties. They didn't allow the absence of one another's body to suspend their desire, but instead, they found a written solution. How different is that to the experiences of sexting and Zoom sessions that many of us had over the pandemic? And wouldn't it have been wonderful if instead of thinking we were the first humans to experience this disembodied desire, we had a historical example to look to, whose written legacy demonstrates a mutual exploration performed in an ethical, loving, and respectful way. I would like to envision a future where kinks and fetishes are not something that are radical to talk about. A time where we truly recognize the universality and diversity of sex as an experience, as a form of play, as a place for empathy. A time where we stop treating an act which ultimately connects all of us as a place for so much division. Wouldn't it be wonderful to think that someday, when someone finds James Joyce's letters, they wouldn't think he was a little bit freaky. But instead, it might serve as a reminder that maybe he was a little bit human too.